so very good afternoon hello a very good afternoon to all who have been successful in coming here today for the course uh it might seem too much of an effort you know attending these courses but believe me whatever you learn over here is what is going to save you and what is going to mark you different from the other contemporaries that you face when you are in practicing all alone in the city okay it is your awareness of these topics which is going to differentiate you from say a general surgeon or a general physician you will realize as time goes by and probably then you will wish that maybe you had given little more attention to these talks however trivial they might seem to you on paper anyway so let's start with this the topic which has been assigned to me is consent taking for procedure and treatment so this is just a brief outline of my talk uh, let's hope that i can cover all of that so if one had to speak scientifically because we are in an academic institution we cannot just take the literal oxford dictionary meaning of the word informed consent so uh, technically speaking what is informed consent it is a process in which a healthcare worker educates a patient about the risks of a given procedure benefits of that procedure and alternatives of the procedure following which competent adults make voluntary decisions about whether to undergo the procedure or intervention now why so much drama i mean why talk about all these things that's because modern society now uh, all democratic societies for sure and even all other countries which don't practice democracy even there it is believed that everyone should respect an individual for whatever he or she stands for and uh, even physicians although we know a disease process better than the patient himself or herself ultimately because the treatment is going to be borne by the patient the respect for autonomy should be there but at the same time it is not mathematics it should be a communication process rather than merely obtaining a signed document but practically speaking a written signed document is not required for all patient doctor interactions for example just quick examinations now if a patient walks into my opd obviously he has come to me as a surgical gastroenterologist surgical gastroenterologist for a for a, for a for a disease related to surgical gastroenterology he isn't walking into my opd for uh, for advice on 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 astrology and that goes without saying so if i put my hand out to ask him to give his hand so that i can take the pulse obviously he knows i'm going to take the pulse you know i'm not going to look at the the, the lines on his palm do you think sir understood but if you're going to do any examination it's still a very good idea and mandatory that you explain what you're going to do and why make it clear that the patient can refuse what you're going to do and you have to be alert because you have to stop immediately if there's any sign that the patient is not comfortable with what you're doing this essentially applies for more intimate examinations like uh, a digital rectal examination or a per vaginal examination or other examinations where say if the part is tender you know and uh, if the patient is uncomfortable obviously you have to stop but these are not written down these are understood so where do you require a formal informed consent obviously for surgery chemo radiotherapy blood transfusions anesthesia vaccination some specific blood tests which are very personal like hiv if you have to do any intervention like a biopsy and if you want to use patient information for research purposes now for this talk i will leave the last part out and i shall only look at consent in you know when you practice as a physician we'll leave the consent for research purposes out of the ambit of today's talk so essentially it just involves five small basic steps which i think everyone can follow uh when you begin talking to the patient just ensure that he has his understanding so he has a capacity to make decision discuss whatever needs to be discussed relevant to the disease on hand ensure that what you're saying is being understood by the patient get the patient to talk back to you so that you can jointly you know deliberate and agree to a plan of care and at each time whatever the patient say should come from a space of voluntariness it should not be forced now why go through so much trouble and why is it so precise as to what is to be done and what is not to be done when so many things are just understood i mean 
you know, if a patient comes to you, it is understood he wants treatment. Why should he actually go to so much ex lengths to explain what you're going to do, ensure that he understands, and all that jazz and drama? Uh, because one, it protects the patient's fundamental right of self-determination. In a society, we have to live by societal rules. It engages the patient in his care, health care, enhances patient-physician uh, relationship. And if you ask me, if I have to look at this whole process from a purely academic point of view, the process of obtaining a good informed consent forces me to reevaluate all the options which are available to the patient, articulate them, and as I'm speaking, convince myself about how good or how bad uh, you know the, the proposition is. And of course, in today's world, it reduces discontent and litigation when there are complications. So who can give informed consent? By law, in most places, the patient who has the ability to receive information about his condition and the proposed treatment and can, can make a choice is the person who, has, who can give informed consent. All that they're trying to say here is that there might be a situation when the person is incapacitated, incapacitated either because of his disease process, he might be comatose, either because he's met with an accident and he's unconscious, or he's under the influence of drugs, so he cannot decide what is good, what is bad for him. He's under the influence of alcohol. Again, he cannot decide what is good, what is bad for him. So if you can decide that the patient is, 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 is the word use is capacity. So if you think that the patient has the capacity to take his own decisions, then the consent form has to be signed by the patient himself. And as long as the patient remains competent, his wishes will supersede any document or any surrogate's wishes. There will be situations, you know, as, as a, uh, especially in foreign country, in, in countries abroad, these things come more into play. I may not be so much in India. But since people live alone, even elderly people live alone, they generally leave, you know, they have a small, uh, it's called the power of attorney. You know, they leave a will which says that suppose I'm incapacitated, such and such person will take decisions on my behalf. That is fine, but only when the person is incapacitated. If he's conscious and aware, he takes decision for himself and not anybody else. So the doctor has to be aware of that. And thing to remember, a transiently incapacitated patient may regain capacity. You know, he might be unconscious now because of blood loss. Once you, you know, get those things in order, he might regain capacity. Then you cannot decide for him. He decides for himself. So what are the steps of obtaining informed consent? You have to communicate the diagnosis prognosis, including very clearly if there are any uncertainties and potential and options of further investigations. You have to outline the proposed treatment or procedure. You have to clearly tell the patient the risks and benefits of treatment. Benefits everybody wants to talk about. Risks people are generally not very comfortable not so much to talk about, but maybe more to hear about the, the risks of a treatment. But by law, and as things stand today in our society, you are doing a duty to yourself. You are doing a service to yourself as a clinician if you clearly upfront enumerate the risks of the procedure. Don't worry, patient is not going to go away. You know, if he has come to you, he has come to you for treatment. It all boils down to how the information is communicated to the patient. So minor complications that occur frequently, by definition, minor complications for in the, in the, in the concept of informed consent are com complications that occur frequently. They have to be told. You cannot just assume that the patient will believe that, you know, post-operatively he will get a urinary retention, so a Foley's catheter may be put. It may have, especially if you're doing, a, say, a pelvic surgery, you know, it has to be told to the patient and he has to understand this. Major complications, most people, most doctors, most clinicians, we tend to not talk about the major complications saying, ye toh, this that doesn't happen every day. But even if once it happens in a year, you know, uh, that can be sufficient to ruin all the good work that you may have done till then. So major complications like death, need for a stoma, especially like in our surgical gastro-urology practice, loss of reproductive uh, function because of pelvic surgery or continence or mobility, it may not happen in everybody, but still it has to be communicated to the patient or his uh, whoever is giving the consent on his behalf. Then any additional process, if it is, it may be necessary. Like for instance, if you're doing an oncological surgery, you know, you might have to remove along with the rectum, you might have to shave a part of the bladder off. 
this has to be told to the patient up front not after you have done it and then you go out and tell the patient ki we also remove this part it's, it doesn't work like that okay so whatever uh, surgery you are planning additional procedures if they may be necessary have to be communicated up front but mind you however good uh, you know uh, well meaning you might be when you are communicating all information to the patient still the patient has a right to refuse treatment then you cannot say that okay if you are not wanting a treatment and you walk out of the room it doesn't work like that it's well within the patient's right and you have to respect that right that he can refuse the treatment that you are offering up front your responsibility doesn't end at that your responsibility continues because then you have to talk to the patient about alternative treatment options surgical or medical or whatever they might be along with the risks and benefits also especially because we are in a teaching institute we roam around as a unit you have a consultant you have a, you know a second level order consultant maybe you might have a junior consultant you have residents but the patient has a right to know who all will be performing the procedure especially in surgical cases this becomes very important part of the procedure is generally left to the residents so that they yeah, this is a training institute okay but the patient when the patient comes to the opd he comes to the consultant but obviously this is a training institute but not everybody understand things for what they are so ideally speaking patient has to be told not to the extreme degree but at least a broad outline that part of the procedure may be done by the resident now this becomes important because the patient has a right to refuse to undergo surgery in sgpgi because residents are doing part of the procedure okay that is well within his rights but no right is just one way the doctor also has a right to refuse to treat a patient because he is not agreeing to being operated by the resident so it can go both ways it's just how you communicate it's not just about holding my right vis-a-vis -vis the patient's right it's how it is communicated then uh this becomes more relevant in western countries but if there are any disclosures that you would like to say for instance if you've got any financial conf conflict of interest it has to be communicated up front another thing which has to be told is that if there is a better center which is known to offer the particular services that you know you are proposing to offer to this particular patient that also has to be communicated to the patient besides these important things if it is a new procedure again that has to be communicated this becomes relevant in oncological uh, decisions when the, if there is a time limit on how much time the patient can take to reach a decision this also has to be told to the patient and the implications of the delay also has to be communicated patient has a right to say doctor i am prepared to take treatment from you and the institute or the hospital wherever it is but i refuse to allow any of my information to be shared for research purposes and it has to be respected patient also has a right to say to you that doctor i hear what you are saying but i would like to take a second opinion you do not have the right to get offended by that you know it is the patient's right you have to allow him to take a second opinion and then if he chooses to come back to you you cannot say that oh you didn't listen to me when i first offered you the treatment now you go away it doesn't work like that okay it is well within the patient's right to take a second opinion and then come back to you if he thinks you are in the best position to offer him the treatment that he desires again may not apply over here but if the patient whatever finances the patient will have to incur also have to be communicated clearly up front uh it goes without saying of course use the patient's language but there might be situation where the patient doesn't speak the language that you speak or you don't speak the patient's language the common strategy then used is just to catch whoever is around the place and you know i speak to that person in tamil and that patient that uh, uh, person speaks to the patient in tamil but lot of information gets lost in uh, translation okay so ideally speaking they should be translators preferably if they are skilled in medical terminology and even if you have to use you know sometimes you may not have a medical translator Sup suppose someone speaks russian you know maybe there might not be any body else who speaks russian in the in the in the in the institute but for translation at least don't use the patient's relatives because they have a tendency to cloud what is being told to the patient by the doctor depending upon how they want the treatment to proceed okay so it's okay to use a third person but not the patient's relative to communicate to the patient when obtaining informed consent and if you have teaching tools like you know videos or pamphlets please use them because they go a long way in clarifying a lot of doubts so one would think that if you spend 45 minutes to 1 hour on obtaining informed consent nothing can go wrong after that well actually that is not true 
unlike what one would call, intuitively like to believe, more is not necessarily better. What is better is if the patient has time to assimilate and digest that information and time to take a decision. So if you want to you know, do a surgery, it is not right that today evening when tomorrow the patient knows he's undergoing some kind of a surgery, tonight you try telling him, see, you can also die on the table, you can also have uh, urinary incontinence post-surgery, you can also have sexual incontinence, I mean, sexual limitations post-surgery. That is not the right way to do it. And ideally, this uh, discussion on, maybe the signing of the document can happen today, but the discussion should have ideally been initiated several days prior so that the patient can assimilate all that is being told to him. And of course, if you use a variety of methods, you know, now we have a plethora of instruments available to convey information. So using more than just communicate, more than just verbal tools goes a long way in clarifying patients' uh, confusions and reassuring him that we know what we're talking about and you know, the best will be done for him. So to put things in perspective, suppose you're taking consent for a simple procedure, run of the mill procedure like laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So the consent form should have the diagnosis, like in this case, it would be a symptomatic gallstones, the proposed treatment, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, alternatives to laparoscopic cholecystectomy, like observation on a low fat diet, risks of cholecystectomy, nothing happens, hundreds of cholecystectomies are done in a day, but still, patient has to be told there's always a chance of bile duct injury, infection, bleeding, because all of these procedures will require a secondary procedure to correct this thing. So it has to be communicated to the, uh, to the patient. Patient may choose not to undergo the surgery. Then it is your responsibility as a treating physician to convey the risks of only observation, like you know, uh, complications developing because of the stones in the gallbladder or another stones migrating down the bile duct. And you also have to document that all these points were discussed and understood and all his queries were answered. Why? Because informed consent is actually a legal document and the responsibility for preparing it lies with the chief operating surgeon. Okay, now we delegate that responsibility in our institute to the residents. That is okay because he or she is equally competent as a consultant to talk about the procedure in a, in a language which the patient understands because we're not talking about high level medical uh, discussion on this. We're talking at elementary level discussion, which anybody who has finished his uh, graduation or post graduation should be able to communicate to a lay person. But the responsibility is of the chief operating surgeon. It has to have the date and time. There has to be a summary of the diagnosis, proposed treatment, risks, benefits, alternative treatment with their risks, benefits. All the people present in the discussion, their names should be noted. Of course, it's not that you always need a witness to sign informed a consent. That is not what it is. Like suppose if a patient comes, single person comes to the OPD and you are you know, explaining a procedure to him and exp trying to get a consent over there, obviously nobody will be present. So it is not mandatory that someone has to be present, but if someone is present, please note that person, whoever is present in a relationship, either to the patient or to the fact that he was a staff nurse or a resident or whatever. Then you have to make a note that the patient understood the concepts and agreed to proceed. He, if he was provided with literature, that has can be mentioned. You have to mention that the patient had an opportunity to ask questions and those questions were answered. And of course, it makes sense to also add that no guarantee was given that the proposed treatment will completely cure the problem. So if all these things have to be there in a consent form, you know, using generic consent forms like most of us do is not right, is not legally right. It will not protect you. And this documentation becomes even more important when the patient refuses treatment. Okay, and over there, an additional line which the patient, the physician has to record is that the risks that were associated because of refusal were also conveyed to the patient and understood by him. And still he chose not to undergo the treatment. So, what happens in an emergency situation? Now, in an emergency situation, obviously the patient cannot give consent because he is comatose or he's not in a position to understand what you're saying and communicate what he wants to say. So there, it is, it is, it is accepted that something known as doctrine of implied consent. That means, if another reasonable person was in the same position as this patient, and if he would have agreed to treatment, it means that this patient would also have agreed to treatment if you could communicate. Okay, 
obviously if a patient is an accident victim on the road he wants to come to the hospital whether he can communicate the take me to the hospital or not depends upon his you know consciousness status and once he comes to the hospital obviously he wants to be treated in the hospital correct so there are some things which is you know, consent is implied so in a true emergency you don't have to wait to take an informed consent you are you are free to, to proceed as expeditiously as is required by the clinical condition but once the patient is in a position to understand the facts of the clinical facts of the case have to be explained to the patient or his family if the same now in some situations what happens is like especially in elderly patients who are staying in you know old age homes and suddenly they are found unconscious they come to the hospital many of them especially in societies which 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 encourage or which promote this kind of living they would have appointed a surrogate decision maker or would have given a power of attorney and if this information is available then it is the doctor's responsibility to get that person to sign the consent form for the patient you cannot just proceed without making an attempt to to trace that person unless it's an emergency now coming to specific situations like informed consent in icus obviously you know patients are going to be very very sick in icus if you spend so much time in obtaining a detailed informed consent for every procedure that needs to be done in icu you are just going to be running back and forth and not doing anything on the patient so all over the world there is substantial variability and obviously controversy because there is no standard uh, way of how consent what kind of consent should be used in icu so essentially three types of consents are formed are followed what is informed consent for each procedure each invasive procedure that you need to do on the patient it's very exhausting but maybe some societies some hospitals can do it more often what is done is bundled consent is taken you know a uh, uh, group of 8 to 10 procedures which are required in just about every patient who comes to the icu like maybe putting in an iv line putting in an arterial line okay putting in a foley catheter putting in a dialysis tube so bundled consent is taken for commonly done procedures in the icu some institutes or some places have taken it to the next level and said if you agree to come to the hospital and to the icu there's something known as a blanket consent where you consent to whatever is being done in the icu of course informed consent for each procedure and blanket consent are both extremes of the spectrum probably the better would be bundled consent and when people looked at literature and people did surveys of people uh, of you know icu in charge is what they found is although blanket consent might seem like an extreme thing for a, for a person from the legal background 30% of the icu in charge is actually use bundled consent and they get people to agree on that because at that point of time he or she she is so vulnerable you will agree to whatever you say so there is a scope for misuse of bundled consent also but that's the way things are and uh, how much consent you weigh up, you you take from the patient's attendance generally depends upon the invasiveness of the procedures like generally urinary catheterization nobody really goes to explain to the patient that you can have a ruptured urethra you know if the bulb is inflated in the urethra rather than the bladder you can have a ruptured urethra these things happen and one ruptured urethra in the male patient is like stricture urethra with all its problems but you generally don't go and ask consent for urethral catheterization so it was found that 5% only obtain cons consent for urethral ca urinary catheterizations but for arterial cons uh, catheterizations about 50% central venous lines about 60% thoracocentesis 80% bronchoscopy 85 just goes to suggest that more invasive the procedure more likely that the icu in charge or icu doctors are going to take consent which is fine a special category again is obstetric patients because they come with their own set of uh, issues uh, ethical concerns moral concerns because you are talking about two lives the mother and the baby but it also presents a unique opportunity in the sense if for an obstetric patient patient knows well in advance that she is pregnant and she is going to deliver at some point in time so uh, you can use this time to initiate all the issues that might happen during the pregnancy and and inform her and whoever else that she chooses to be informed with well in advance it's a good idea to inform all of them that 2 to 3% of all pregnancies can be affected by fetal anomalies and so discuss upfront whether the patient wants to you know to go for risk assessment diagnosis and management and whatever it's a good idea to tell all patients that even a low risk pregnancy can without warning become a high risk for which a cesarean delivery may be necessary particularly patients with pre existing diseases should be clearly told how the diseases can worsen what are the symptoms to watch out for and when they should approach medical facility and uh, even patients who develop malignancies either during pregnancies or pregnant patients who go on to become uh, i mean sorry patients with pre existing malignancies who go on to become pregnant they also have to be communicated depending upon whatever the situation is
in children it is not called informed consent because you know child child technically is is a, is a person less than 18 years of age in india in some countries it is 16 some countries even 14 so instead of informed consent what we obtain is informed permis permission from the parents or legal guardians now uh, this becomes slightly complex with adolescent children because if the needs and wishes of the child are in conflict with the opinions and preferences of the parents uh, there could be a bit of a tug of war over there you have to go by the law you know you cannot allow your personal uh, personal empathy or personal sympathy to come into this picture what the law states you will have to follow it's not in your domain to judge who is right or who is wrong what is morally correct or morally wrong that is not our job what the law says we'll have to abide by that a child, a person, even if he's less than 18 years of age, in some ways is considered legally emancipated. Like for instance, if the child is less than 18 years of age and married, minors who are living away from home without parental financial support, homeless minors found on the roads, runaways, in countries where it is compulsory, those children serving in the military are considered capable of taking their own decision. Mothers of children, you know, if they're less than 18 years of age, but if they have a child, they're considered capable of taking decision for themselves. And if the child is able to prove financial independence, the court permits him or her to take decisions for himself, even if he's below 18 years of age. Whatever you might do, patient can withdraw consent at any time during the procedure. And once the consent is withdrawn, Later on, if he agrees to, you know, allow you to proceed, you still have to obtain a new consent, go through the whole process all over again. There's no point getting irritated or angry and, you know, uh, losing your cool because uh, it is well within the patient's lie rights, which is recognized by law. So best thing is, let things go, start on it all over again. Now this new term, instead of informed consent, I just thought I would introduce this over here. It's called shared decision making, just a rearrangement of words because uh, what they wanted to show was that now consent should be uh, a balance between evidence-based medicine and good patient care. In a sense, present everything that is known about the condition and uh, make sure that he understands and then gives consent. It's the same thing, it's just that this term now is making the rounds in, in, in our, all our PubMed searches, so I just thought I would introduce this term of uh, informed consent is now being called shared decision-making. So then again, you know, people have actually systematically tried to see that is it better for, for patients in general if you talk to them in detail about their condition? Are they happier if you, you know, take them to a room, uh, make them sit down, explain to them all the nitty gritties of the procedure? This generally happens in a clinical trial setting, you know, in oncology clinical uh, trial settings because the concerns are so detailed. There can be so many hassles with those things or trying out a new medicine or a new vaccine. Those consents are very, very, very detailed as opposed to what the consents that we obtain for a routine day to day clinical practice. So people have actually compared patient comprehension and satisfaction of informed consent in routine clinical care with the level of comprehension and satisfaction of patients treated within clinical trials. And what they found was that extensive informed consent procedures for clinical uh, cancer trials are not necessarily associated with higher levels of satisfaction or objective understanding. So just because you speak more or it doesn't necessarily mean patient is going to be more satisfied. The essence is get down to what the patient will understand, communicate effectively and uh, be honest about things and document. At least follow what the law asks you to follow. So to summarize, consent is required for any examination, treatment, or intervention involving an adult who has the capacity to give it, except in case of emergencies or if the patient is mentally unstable or unable to do it. And uh, for a consent to be valid, patient should have capacity. We've already discussed uh, this, and they should be acting voluntarily. Sometimes, you know, patients are coerced into something. Generally happens in fields like organ donation where the wife is, because of parental, not parental, uh, you know, uh, home pressures, the size is being forced to donate, uh, to agree to organ donation for the husband. So as a physician, it is a responsibility, it's a duty to ensure that the consent is voluntary. Family members cannot give consent for a patient who is who has the capacity to do it himself. 
doesn't happen in India. Most of the times, if you're sitting in your OPD, you will have a patient, a sick patient, elderly patient, and then the, the, the son or daughter coming with him, telling you after some time, Doctor, is inko mat bataiye, and inko thoda bahar jaane dijiye. You know, ideally speaking, that is not on. Whatever age or stage the patient is, uh, physiological and disease-wise, he has a right to know his diagnosis, prognosis, and the treatment that you're offering. Not the son, daughter, daughter-in-law, son-in-law, none of those. Consent may be uh, implied, for example, as it happens in most of our OPD practices, or explicit. I've already indicated, uh, listed the indications where you need explicit con consent. And consent actually should be a continuing process rather than a one-off decision. And uh, remember, patients can change their mind at any time about the treatment. And they can refuse treatment. Even if they understand that they can have, they can be death as a consequence of that, they are well within their rights to refuse treatment. You cannot force a patient to undergo any surgery or any procedure saying that you will die if you don't undergo. It's his right what he wants to happen to his body. And another thing is, patient cannot demand treatment that is not clinically appropriate. Over that, you have a control. Thank you. If there's anything you would like to ask, I'll be happy to answer.